Hello and welcome to this talk on sexual dysfunctions and the internet. I'm Daryl Mead from the Reward Foundation, Love, Sex and the Internet. We're based in Edinburgh and we're a sex and relationship education charity. Since 2014, we've spoken directly to over 10,000 people and delivered training to professionals in a dozen countries. Today, I'll be drawing upon material from our full day course on pornography and sexual dysfunctions, which is accredited by the Royal College of General Practitioners. I'm delighted to have an opportunity to speak to Fathers Network Scotland. We've admired your growth and success as a leading advocate of the role of fathers. In this session, I'll explore three things. How pornography use has had the power to affect our mental and physical health how it has the potential to change our relationships and our lives. And I will also offer some suggestions about how to talk to kids about porn. Today, I will discuss pornography and other adult sexual themes. I will use formal scientific language throughout, but I apologize in advance for any offense I may cause. No pornography is shown. Porn has the power to affect mental and physical health and at the same time it has a lot of perceived benefits otherwise people wouldn't use it. Many men and boys use porn, often quite a lot, and today pornography use by women and girls is also increasing. It's free, anonymous and always available. But is it risk free? Well, first of all, let's have a look at some of the many reasons that people use porn. Um, we're all sexual beings and we find watching sexual material very pleasant. Internet pornography has become manual for sex for younger people. It reduces inhibitions and barriers and it's clearly sexual minority friendly. It potentially allows the exploration of your sexual identity. Um, but as we may uh, will see, it could also change your sexual identity. And it's often been um, suggested as something that will provide you with ideas for better partnered sex. It's inclusive, potentially, because everybody's doing it. And certainly some um, marriage counsellors and quite a lot of popular magazines um, will recommend porn to spice up a stable relationship. Now, porn has the power to affect mental and physical health. A large amount of research now suggests that porn does this. The great majority of research finds negative effects associated with pornography use. There are very few quality studies finding positive outcomes. But please be aware that the commercial pornography industry says exactly the opposite. It wants you to consume its products and will always deny they could be anything other than excellent for your health. The key of today's talk is this idea of porn masturbation and orgasm. The point is that people do not just watch pornography. Almost everybody uses it as a masturbation aid and ends their pornography session with an orgasm. Worldwide, the great majority of porn sessions take between 9 and 14 minutes. This just happens to be the time uh, for an average person takes to masturbate when aroused with material they've not seen before. If you talk to many boys, and I have, you find they consider porn and masturbation to be the same thing. In their world, all masturbation happens with porn. Now, orgasm is key as an orgasm produces the largest cascade of brain chemicals of any behavior, almost all favorable. The change in brain chemistry from orgasm is roughly equivalent to the changes a person gets when they consume cocaine. This effect is so powerful that 15 years ago, Dutch neuroscientists wrote, 
Of all activities on the internet, porn has the most potential to become addictive. In simple terms, sex happens in the brain rather than in the genitals. Yes, we use our genitals, but the orgasm is in the head. In the UK, about 70% of all porn is viewed on a mobile phone. The importance of phones as the viewing platform just continues to grow and grow. Everyone has a phone, and that means everyone has access to unlimited amounts of free pornography. Next, I want to talk about sexual conditioning. Pornography is having two separate effects on us when we use it in a sustained way. On one level, it is helping us with conscious learning. It's telling us, so that's what I should do when I have sex. But watching porn, we are learning scripts about how to have sex. And the mirror neurons in our brain are showing us what to do. It is really monkey see, monkey do. At the same time, we are also having a process of unconscious learning where the message is, this material turns me on. Over time, this becomes, I need porn to get aroused. And these things are happening because there are physical changes inside the brain. Now, a wide range of mental health issues are now known to be linked to substantial pornography use. Most of these take some time to arise. We do not begin watching pornography this week and have mental health problems next week. It's just not like that. It's a slow burn. And the somewhat unhelpful news is that pornography encourages most mental health issues. Over 90% of the people coming to the Reward Foundation's website today first land on the page called Mental Effects of Porn, and that's nearly a thousand people a day on an average day. Work with people who've given up porn a consumption suggests that their brain fog, their inability to concentrate, and the levels of constant sexual fantasy reduce once they stop consuming porn. Loneliness can be increased by pornography use. If you're at home watching lots of porn and masturbating, you're not out socialising with people. Heavy porn use increases social anxiety and leads to elevated stress responses. It encourages the development of depression and lethargy. And the perfect bodies of most porn performers, uh, the larger the normal penises, bottoms, six packs and breasts on display, encourage many porn consumers, particularly young people, to have body image problems. Many people simply don't look like the folk in porn. I know I don't. This is bad for your mental health. At the most extreme, excessive pornography consumption has been linked to suicidal ideation and it frequently coexists with other mental health disorders and other addictions. What about the physical health issues? Well, physical health issues from consuming a lot of porn can be very simple. Um, it could be nothing more than over-rubbing your genitals, making you sore because you're having a binge or you're edging for hours. However, for many men, internet pornography consumption leads to sexual problems, including erectile dysfunction. We are now living in a world where we are seeing many men and boys lose interest in real sexual partners. They simply cannot compete with the amazing varieties of bodies in pornography. And this is an unprecedented thing in the history of humanity. Let's dive in and look a little bit more in detail at porn-induced erectile dysfunction. It's the big story. Now, if we look at the history of chronic erectile problems with, with partners or even with porn, um, traditionally, um, erectile dysfunction has been a problem of older men. It was something that men with heart problems have or with diabetes or other serious health conditions. And as we would expect until about 2002, the historical rates of uh, rectal dysfunction for men under 40 in research studies by urologists was pretty low, below 3% in the population. Now this was before uh, internet porn became a big thing and uh, the before broadband and fast internet arrived in our lives. Now research shows that more than a third of men under 40 have problems 
achieving an erection during partnered sex. We have gone from 3% to 30%, a thousand percent increase in a decade. There's also other sexual dysfunctions related to the use of pornography. Um, and that covers all of the things that could go wrong with a, with a man's um, reproductive system, delayed ejaculation, the inability to orgasm, difficulties with our partnered sex, and a good indication that um, a man or boy has a problem is if um, morning or nighttime erections um, stop occurring. Our body chemistry should give us an erection um, every day, sort of four or five in the morning, something like that. When that stops happening, it's an indication that you're using too much porn and masturbating too much. So, how much porn is too much? This is a key question. Uh, now, there's no clear signal. We know if we eat too much food, we feel sick, we, be, we get fat over time. If you're consuming too much alcohol, again, you become blurry, you become ill. But we, our bodies don't have a mechanism, an evolved mechanism, to tell us what's going wrong if we have too much porn. And not everyone has the same susceptibility to the negative effects of pornography use. Each brain is unique. We have a simple quiz on the Reward Foundation website which suggests the signs of too much porn use. We suggest that uh, you or someone that you may be caring for try that if uh, there are as a possibility of issues. A major study by neuroscientists in Germany back in 2014 showed that even with moderate use of pornography of three hours per week or less, it's possible to see real changes in the way our brains are wired. In simple terms, people who do not watch pornography have some parts of their brain connected more effectively than people uh, who watch pornography. So what's the prevalence in society? Now, essentially porn problems are a male problem. Um, this research I'm quoting here is by a Spanish group and they uh, found it was primarily men and boys. Um, they didn't look at boys um, in detail, but they found that the people most at risk were the men between 26 and 40 years. And they um, are people who've been using porn for a long time. Now, porn changes relationships and lives, fathers need to consider what impact their own porn use may be having on their relationships with their partners. Or if you're a single man, um, you need to think about how much porn is featuring in your life. And if you are a father, you need to be aware of what it means to be a good father to your son and how you can communicate about pornography. We'll look at that more when we talk about children later on. Pornography has the ability to change the way we think about sex and the way we behave in sex. And this can have quite serious consequences. Now, almost half of all porn users escalate, that is they develop tolerance and they move to stronger and stronger pornography. This paper we're looking at is some French research where a group of men they studied spent an average of three hours a week using pornography, which they called online sexual activities. Now, most respondents, 99% of them, um, used their porn at home and 97% of them reported masturbation to the porn. Now, the key point is that 49%, half essentially, mentioned sometimes searching for sexual content they had not been previously interested in or that they considered disgusting. This is basically, you watch too much porn, you get bored, and you go look for something else. And that can mean if you're straight watching gay porn, um, it can also mean there's potential for you to escalate to watching child pornography, which is illegal. And well over half reported that sometimes what they viewed made them feel shame or guilt. In this search for stronger pornography or more shocking material, 
uh, indicates their, the users were developing tolerance. Now with drug addiction, uh, you need more of the drug over time to get the same high, whether it's heroin, cocaine, marijuana, whatever. With pornography, you need new and different. I want to dip in a little bit to some interesting survey work done by the Sunday Times in 2019 because it gives a window on the overall behaviour of UK porn consumers. And I'm only going to pick out um, three specific areas to talk about. Now, 58% of the people who responded to the survey on sexuality said they watched internet pornography, and that would be roughly tallying with other ways we estimate. So approximately half of the adult population of the UK uses pornography. It's a bit more, but how much more is hard to say. And the next three um, slides will be based on what we've seen from the subset of the three and a half thousand people who said they used porn. Now, within the sample, we have here six um, bar charts with men on the left and women on the right. Um, basically, this tells us that men say they watch porn more frequently. The top four uh, bar charts um, for men is nearly three quarters of the men watching anywhere between once a week and more than once a day. Women tend to watch less frequently, but they're still watching. Now the startling things to us that came out from this survey data was what people said they liked to see. Rough sex and bondage discipline and sadomasochism the younger you are, the more people like it. Uh, people of my age in the 55 to 73 category, 7% 7 of them said they liked rough sex. Well, it's six times as many for the Gen Z, the people under 22. And the same general trend is visible within the bondage discipline and sadomasochism, but it is not as popular as a genre. But we have real concerns about rough sex being popular because rough sex essentially can be equated to violence against women. We know that there are big issues with domestic violence. Uh, we, are, we also know that um, sex crime is the only area of crime substantially rising over time in Scottish society. So this, to me, is a very concerning thing. And more concerning is who likes the rough sex and the BDSM, where exactly twice as many women as men reported that they preferred rough sex or BDSM as uh, genres of porn. Now, we believe that this is partly because women are watching more pornography and that is influencing what they like. There's also the question of fiction, the Fifty Shades of Grey phenomenon, where women will submit for money, wealth, power, whatever, to sexual domination and violence. Taking it to another level of um, challenge, I'd like to talk briefly about non-fatal strangulation. Now, for us, this is a major uh, area of concern, um, the inclusion of, of strangulation in sex play. Uh, the pornography industry repackages it as air play or breath play. But being strangled during sex can produce stronger orgasms, but it's an incredibly dangerous thing to do. And this list of um, what can happen to you if you have been sex, uh, uh, strangled during sex and have it gone wrong is an indication of the dangers that people are undertaking. Our health service are seeing more people doing this. And um, I recently saw a PhD thesis done in America on um, non-fatal strangulation or attempted that ended up with, with fatal strangulation and they had hundreds of reports from the coroners of people who died during um, sexual activity. Another scary area are uh, the harms inflicted upon children by others and the possible role of pornography in this. Uh, this can be abuse of children by adults or due to child on child sex abuse. Now, first of all, all sexual and sexualized images of children under the age of 18 years in the UK 
are illegal. And that means that if a 16-year-old sends a sexting image to another 16-year-old, um, they are potentially both in breach of law and they can get into quite a lot of trouble. At the same time, um, having sex with children or consuming sexual um, uh, images of children are both major growing crimes and pornography is a powerful tool in grooming children and helping uh, getting them to act out what they're seeing. Now, grooming by adults is who want to um, abuse children is very common and it's almost always linked to the use of pornography. Early exposure to pornography increases the likelihood of a person engaging in sex-based crime but also in behaving in a more wild fashion with drugs, alcohol, um, missing school, those sorts of things. Um, general exposure to pornography um, has now been linked to increases in human trafficking. If you watch more porn, you tend to want to be able to have more sexual services over the internet or to be able to visit prostitutes or engage in other activities like that in order to keep the flow of um, people who are generally unwilling um, to participate in uh, prostitution um, is human trafficking. We are seeing a lot more of that in uh, Scotland and there have been major gangs um, broken up in the last few years. And the figures for child-on-child -child sexual abuse have been rising dramatically in the last few years. Um, it's in, in four-year period, it went up by a third in, in Scotland and well over half in England and Wales. Australian research with children convicted of child-on-child -child sex abuse strongly suggested that helping young people manage their pornography use will reduce the levels of offending. That's what the children who had been convicted asked for. They wanted more help to control their own porn use. Now, a diagnosis. Is there such a thing as the diagnosis of problematic pornography use? And the simple answer now is yes. In 2018, the World Health Organization released its International Classification of Diseases, um, Edition 11, so ICD-11. And there are now two potential diagnoses that professionals can use. These are Compulsive Sexual Behaviour Disorder and other specified disorders due to addictive behaviours. The ICD-11 will become uh, the standard worldwide uh, textbook on how to diagnose disease in 2022. But this is there and professionals are already starting to use um, these diagnoses. Next I'm going to show a short video which summarises a lot of the ideas presented so far. It was made to encourage governments to think about introducing age verification legislation for pornography. Pornography is supposed to be adult entertainment and until we have effective age verification, up to 30% of all pornography is viewed by under 18s. Access to pornography should be maintained online in the same way as we manage gambling, blades, prescription drugs, alcohol and weapons. Okay. Gabe started with porn at 12. By the time he was 22, he couldn't get it up, even for a girl he was really attracted to. That's called erectile dysfunction, or ED, and it used to be pretty rare. For decades, only about 3% of men under 40 had it. But from 2010 on, rates skyrocketed. Now they're up around 35%. There's a reason for that steep increase. Since 2006, it's become very easy to stream free video porn online and access even the hardcore stuff with a few clicks. Effects took a while to show up, but basically the data says more hardcore porn and fewer hard-ons are connected. After all, guys haven't suddenly become nervous about performing. They can get it up okay for porn, just not with partners. And when they quit porn, their erections come back but it can take months. No wonder. Brain scans show that compulsive users react to porn like addicts react to triggers for cocaine use. 
and in a BBC3 survey of young people, 14% of all female and more than 30% of all male participants believed they were actually addicted to porn. And there's more. Research showed that watching a lot of porn made users six times more likely to be aggressive in a sexual relationship. No more boners and issues with your partner seem like an awfully high price to pay for internet porn that's supposed to be free. And that's a lie anyway. Free porn is a business. It helps to sell pills to fix your limp dick. It wants you to pay for premium content or sex aids. And it sells your personal data to advertisers so they can target you better. That's why governments need to step in and require age verification for online porn, just as with alcohol, cigarettes and gambling. When you turn 18, you can make your own decisions. And you'll have a better chance of enjoying actual, real sex with a partner. Until then, skip the porn, save your boner. For help, go to... I'll move now on to education. Now, most of the resources for parents have been written by women uh, with mothers in mind as the person giving um, the talk. I believe that a father's input is possibly more valuable, given that it's mainly boys who use pornography and they are more likely to take heed of what their fathers say rather than their mothers. A lot of fathers who use pornography will probably dismiss the need to talk to their sons about it because they start using pornography when they were young and believe it didn't do them any harm. But we do need to bear in mind that pornography today is vastly different from the pornography of the past in terms of its impact on the brain. Softcore magazines is not the same as three hours of hardcore off the net every day. It's really important for fathers to educate themselves about the mental and physical impact of porn today. It's both a medical and social matter a part of growing up and a part of growing into being a good and well-functioning man and ultimately father. We recommend that people educate themselves and one tool uh, we recommend is this book, Your Brain on Porn. It's the number one best-selling book on Amazon in the pornography self-help category and it's available in lots of different formats. Now I must declare an interest as some of the revenue from sales of this book support the work of our charity, The Reward Foundation. Your Brain on Porn uses the addiction model to understand how and why we can become hooked on using pornography. It includes hundreds of stories showing how people can end their addiction to pornography. And one special thing in the book um, is a discussion of flatlining, which is a particular characteristic of pornography use that doesn't appear in any other addiction. As a behavioural addiction, problematic pornography use is quite similar to other addictions like gambling or gaming. However, flatlining is its special thing. It's a sudden loss of libido and appears to be unique to pornography withdrawal. How long flatline lasts and how easy it is to overcome depends on many factors. There is the issue of the age at which you began using porn, how long a person has been using it heavily and the extent to which they've become dependent. Understanding the process of neuroplasticity helps people to persist in their recovery. I'd now like to move on to how to talk to kids. A big takeaway I want you to have from today's talk is that we should not just have one porn talk with our sons and daughters. Pornography is something there in the environment for young people. It's something you should be able to discuss as a part of helping your children grow up. You need to use age appropriate language for each child in your conversation. Talking about pornography and sexual development should be a natural part of family conversations and by spreading it out, it is much more effective. Now, this can be easy in theory uh, than it is in practice. The good news is that there are now many resources available to help you if you find this an uncomfortable journey. And we'll finish with a few resources. On our website at rewardfoundation.org, 
is the Free Parents Guide to Internet Pornography. We created the Free Parents Guide to give people links to a huge range of resources designed to help you have those difficult conversations. We update the Free Parents Guide with new resources every two or three months and it currently has links to about a hundred separate resources. We also respect the work of an organisation in the US called Culture Reframed. They have specific tools to help you have difficult conversations through their program for parents of tweens or program for parents of teens. They go as far as providing fully scripted conversations for you to have with children and adolescents. And again, this is a completely free resource. The Rod Foundation now also has lesson plans for schools. So if you're a teacher or you want to encourage uh, these subjects to be taught in schools, uh, the Rod Foundation has launched a set of seven free lesson plans based on the sort of content I've been talking about today. We look at what makes for a loving, trusted, intimate relationship. The Reward Foundation lessons also cover legal issues around sexting and pornography in Scotland. The lessons were prepared by a qualified Scottish lawyer working with a leading sex education teacher. I'd like to conclude by saying thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. If you're seeing this as an online recording, you can direct uh, email questions through Fathers Network Scotland and I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you for your attention. Well, that was really interesting, I have to say. Um, <clears throat> really interesting. I've got so many questions. <laughs> um, I suppose what, what I'm interested in is obviously there's a link between um, what you can see with uh, cocaine use. So there's parallels between cocaine use and use of porn. And I was just wondering whether you can kind of talk about that, that kind of brain chemistry. Well, um, yes, we can. There aren't, there isn't much in the way of direct studies um, comparing head to head pornography and cocaine use, but there is um, a range of studies um, that look at um, porn use um, as, um, as a parallel thing. So there's quite a lot of um, reference. And in, and in terms of um, the way uh, both cocaine and pornography uh, work with the dopamine circuit and what happens when you have a, um, a, an orgasm and what happens when you take cocaine, the levels um, have been mapped quite um, clearly in terms of we do know uh, what the differences look like. Um, I'm not probably the best person to, to go into more detail about that. Um, um, there's a video on our um, YouTube site um, featuring the work of Don Hilton, a, a neurosurgeon in Texas, and it's our most successful video it's at about 7,000 views. Um, it's five minutes long. It was part of a New Zealand um, television documentary. It goes into considerable detail about the brain chemistry, um, referring back to um, uh, brain uh, imaging studies done at the University of Cambridge, as well as some of Don's own work. So um, there is quite a bit out there. And Sorry, Chris, were you going to ask something? No, there you go. I was going to say, are you, I mean, presumably it's quite difficult to get uh, funding to look into this stuff or, or is, I mean, is the amount of scientific work um, increasing or, you know, it seems like such a massive problem. <laughs> I'm just kind of, I'm, I'm wondering whether there's resources to, to do the science to underpin trying to make changes with policy. Uh... There is, in some areas, there's reasonable funding, but there, there's a couple of, um, well, structural issues. Um, if you look at um, the biggest funder of brain imaging studies in the world and also uh, the largest um, investor in mental health issues, it's the US government. And they have explicitly decided um, in the last few years not to fund any research into human sexuality and certainly nothing into porn. 
So getting big ticket money for brain studies is quite difficult. There are ever increasing amounts of social science material available in research. On an average week, three or four academic papers are published on um, the effects of pornography on human sexuality, on mental health, physical health. There's a lot of work going on there. In terms of the high quality brain studies, um, we're lucky if we get something once every three months from around the world. Um, so international consortiums have been taking on doing that sort of work, but it's very much with um, Europe taking the lead and the UK as well. Uh, but funding has been a, a big issue and um, we've tried to broker um, improved research funding between academics and um, funders and we found it pretty hard work. And it's not because it's not important, but it's a, a taboo subject. Nobody wants to talk about porn. It's, uh, it's icky. It's not sort of stuff that you, you, know, you feel good as a funder. Um, and uh, I apply for grants all the time to support our research. We've now published six academic papers um, in the last four years. And we funded all that work through our charities, other funding. We have not been getting um, any um, external funding for that just because you can't do it. Gosh. And do you think, I was just thinking about the situation with COVID at the moment, presumably um, it's likely that there's going to be an increase in use and therefore an increase in the problems surrounding use. Are you, seeing, are you seeing any evidence of that? Yes, well, right at the start of the, um, the lockdown, um, Pornhub, the world's biggest supplier, initially made supplies in three countries, including Italy, where we were having the really big COVID uh, uh, problems. Uh, Pornhub Premium was made free in three countries. Um, then by June, they made Pornhub uh, Premium free throughout the world. And as a result, um, traffic uh, went up by about a third. And people are at home, they're locked in, and pornography is one of the things that they can, they can use and they can do. And it's, um, oh, that's, it has become a major thing. There's some academic research on that. Um, some colleagues, uh, Mark Potenza from uh, Yale, um, uh, has done a paper on um, what we're expecting in terms of impacts from um, COVID on the levels of pornography use and its um, uh, ultimate effects on, on mental health. Uh, Potenza is a professor of child psychiatry and he's quite concerned. That's, I, I'm kind of interested in that. Obviously, um, Chris has been working um, on perinatal mental health and mental health issues and it's something that as an organisation we're, we're quite passionate about. And I, I'm, I'm interested what you think um, the the real impact that porn is having on mental health of men particularly and is is it i mean presumably it's an accumulative thing but yes. um you know what what i'm, I'm kind of interested in it i'm i'm wondering uh, what you well, think the proportion of the problem is down to porn or well the, the there's the issues of what porn does to the man himself and his mental health over time so it, it is gradual it, it's contributing to um, across the board increases in things like depression and lethargy and just making things more difficult. It also um, contributes to changes in the way men and women interact within the family and within sexual relationships. So uh, we're quite concerned that if, if you've got to say a domestic violence situation within a household and we know that domestic violence is at all time records in Scotland as it is in many other countries. the um, it's like pouring kerosene on a fire. Adding porn in is a, an unhealthy element of the mix. It encourages more violent behaviour. Uh, there's been a lot of studies looked at how much um, mainstream pornography includes elements of um, uh, gender-based violence. Um, with the radical feminists see pornography purely as um, a gender-based violence issue. Um, I, I don't personally go as far as that, but it is quite, it, it, it's really not doing anybody um, any real help. Uh, we have quite a lot of uh, resources on our mental health page on our website that we'd encourage people to look at if they do have problems, um, includes refer referrals to other 
um, agencies. We do not provide therapy or, or direct intervention ourselves. But uh, it is uh, the fact that um, a thousand people a day come to our website to look at our mental health page. I mean, to me, that tells you an awful, awful lot. We've never had a page like this in five years of running the website. Um, at one point, it got to 2,000 a day. Depends on how Google's algorithms go. God. Uh, can I ask something? Um, uh, just uh, a couple of years. Well, was it, listening to your talk, obviously, it was kind of uh, according to me and probably occurs to a lot of people. Um, other things that that, 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 that that humans indulge in, you know, things like alcohol, cigarettes, and so on. Mm -hmm. We know we know what the risks are, and we know how damaging it is, and that's why you can only do these things uh, once you're eighteen or older. Um, and uh, that was one of the recommendations in the film was that you know governments need to be involved so that people need to be using things like credit cards so that they can access the you know pornography or whatever that was going to happen in this country um, but I can't remember why it didn't why, why didn't we go ahead with that in the UK well there's, there's no official answer as to why we didn't um, well there is an official answer but it's not a very good one just before the last election um, only about um, two weeks before the legislation has already passed by and been agreed by Parliament and was supposed to come in, into force. And uh, as far as we can tell, um, the Tories and Boris Johnson decided that, that imposing age verification for porn would be likely to make voters less likely to um, vote for the Conservative Party. So they pulled the, legis or the legislation, the enactment of the legislation, was already, it's already fully through Parliament. So we had a regulator set up, we had a system set up, and it was all ready to go. Um, and um, so that's why, what we think happened. Um, the other thing that, what, what they used was the excuse of the online harms bill and the fact that we need to deal with all lot online harms. Commercial pornography suppliers are the main place that most people get their porn. but these days you can get an awful lot from various social media platforms um, and the government has said that they will therefore do a unified set of um, oh, legislation under the cover of the online harms bill it's been a white paper already which would therefore incorporate this and they're going to change the regulator from the british board of film classification to ofcom the downside of that is that we guess it'll be 2024 um, before that legislation um, has been both formulated, passed by Parliament and then put into practice. Um, we ran um, at the Royd Foundation um, the world's first international conference on age verification back in June. Um, there's still bits of that on, on our website where we had 150 people from 29 countries attend and it's likely that quite a few other countries will actually have age verification before us. It's currently in, uh, being enacted in Poland. Um, the South Africans have just about finished a, um, a, a version of doing it. Um, the, nice. the French have done it through um, a, a piece of legislation in their Senate. Uh, so it is gradually coming throughout the world and um, so long answer i'm sorry to be your question but it is a long complicated thing it should have happened it we were in the british board of film classifications office a week before they were supposed to launch they were completely blindsided by the fact the government changed its mind yeah I, it's really interesting i mean i suppose it, it, it does make sense doesn't it you know <laughs> There's a really good joke in there, but I'm getting to so much. <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good news headline, I suppose. Um, so yeah, I guess the time to bring that in would be uh, would be now. You know, at the at the, at the start of a uh, political cycle, as opposed to near the end, then wouldn't it? Um, and I guess, as Cathy was saying there, you know that you know we all suspect, and you, you, you've seen it from your. Uh, how many people are hitting your own website and so on, that the, the, the use of internet pornography and so on has probably gone through the roof over the last nine months and well, the effects that it's going to be having on people. If you, if you, you look at um, the most popular websites in the world, um, three pornography sites are in the top 15. Um, you know, got Google's more than anybody else, but like the, the Pornhub gets more um, traffic than Netflix and... Um, who's the other ones that they, we, anyway, well, certainly they get way more traffic than, say, Netflix every day. 
the number of users. I mean, the UK, um, more than 10% of the population of the UK go to Pornhub every day. Now, not everybody goes every day, so that suggests that a good chunk of the population is going sometimes once a week, once a month, whatever. There are other pornography suppliers. Pornhub is actually only the second biggest single site, um, but the company that owns them is biggest because it actually owns nine of the top 15 sites. It is a mega industry and nobody talks about it. Well, it's, um, I remember the old adage used to be that pornography was what uh, um, propelled Pornography was what um, won the battle for VHS over Betamax all those years ago, um, because sure. the people pornography made their films and with the VHS format, and Betamax was apparently a better product. So very much the, the, the commercial uh, photographers used Betamax, but the pornography industry was responsible for things like the pay per view was invented there, um, the freemium model was invented by porn. Um, there's, there's a lot that they have done and it is a very um, powerful industry now and we find lobbying against them um, and trying to get them to behave themselves better is, is really quite difficult. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess it's no different from the tobacco industry or the gambling industry. I mean, we've, we've had a lot of conversations with colleagues recently about gambling and it's pitiful, you know, the, um, the amount of uh, uh, money that, is, uh, that they are asked to put aside from the revenues uh, to fund, uh, you know, uh, work around to support people with gambling problems and so on. So um, the other thing I was going to uh, ask you was, you mentioned that, yeah, we, I think it, it probably makes sense to all of us, you know, that um, it's not it's not an attractive thing for funders to fund, you know. Um, but some of the stats that you've thrown out there um, are really quite relevant just now. So, for example, the, the link to, to suicidal ideology and so on. We're actually um, in, in conversation at the moment, anyway, with with colleagues in the Scottish government about uh, um, investigating whether or not there there is, and we think there is, but, but whether or not there is a link between increased suicidal behaviour uh, in men during the perinatal period, when you know when they're about to become a new dad or when they just become one. Mm -hmm. And I suppose uh, I've just took taken some notes. I was I was in a meeting last night talking to some people about this. And just sort of thinking about what kind of, because obviously with any piece of research, it can grow arms and legs. And before you know it, you know, you have to kind of keep it quite focused. But I would imagine that with something like this, um, we're going to have to talk about COVID. And we're going to have to talk about the impact that the current context has had. And I think that pornography will probably come into that uh, research as well. But the other thing being that, um, again, in my experience, what I, used, I spent a lot of time working in high schools and working with health colleagues. And believe it or not, go back seven or eight years, um, school nurses and youth workers uh, didn't shy away from talking about uh, pornography and internet pornography. We actually had a peer support or a peer led uh, piece of work in one of the schools we worked in. So young people led this piece of work and it was all about pornography and the schools really supported that. So I suppose the point being is that there's, is, is, is that there's probably some fertile ground um, for uh, doing more around this kind of work, and maybe it's just looking to those avenues, you know, um, because schools don't. In my, some schools will, some schools won't, but the schools that I worked in certainly didn't shy away from it. And I suppose it's a very powerful thing if you can say to a room full of fifteen or sixteen-year-old boys, a third of you, a third of you are going to be suffering from erectile dysfunction right now, uh, dysfunction right now because of uh, pornography use. It's a really hard hit. And, I mean, I was surprised to see that it was as much as a third. I mean, that, that, that's, that's enormous. It is enormous. And, it, well, um, yes, it, it is a, a, a profound um, impact. And it's the sort of thing that we want to build on. Um, we've put in all sorts of things to the Scottish Government over time, but without, you know, we have, we, we're not a bigger lobbying organisation like Fathers Network, so we don't have sort of the same um, impact. But yeah, we, we do think that you need to take this on board um, and our free lessons are, are, are part of our response to try and get the dialogues going. We initially thought we would sell the lessons. We came to the conclusion that the schools don't really have the money but, and we, don't, we want to remove all the barriers, which is why like we've, we've distributed about a thousand lesson plans so far. Um, and a reasonable number of them in Scotland. We have taught in most of the independent schools in Scotland 
um, some point in the last five years. Um, so, but uh, it, it's, it, it's, it's, it's something that needs to be done. Boys at 15, 16 are probably not going to have problems. It's when they're 18 and 19, the research is now suggesting they've had long enough on the porn for it to kick in. It can happen earlier, but that's um, an outlier rather than it being most normal. But it, it's not at all unusual for um, a man of 18, 19, 20 now to have problems. And it, it should be extraordinarily unusual yeah. rather than a third of them. That's just crazy. That's um, so nice, yeah. Daryl, what sort of, I mean, going into schools, obviously you said, or, or, or previously you said that it's an ongoing, ongoing conversation that parents and uh, adults around kids should be having with, with their children. But at what point is the message most effective? I'm just thinking about my own experience of having, you know, young boys in the house and thinking about when you should have that kind of, that, that, that chat, when, when their stats would actually, you know, make a difference. Well, I think that that's actually asking the wrong question, because if you're thinking it's going to be a chat at the right point, then you've actually missed all of the earlier opportunities. We should be starting off with six year olds to tell him to keep the pants on when they're in in groups with other people and learning the correct names of the anatomical body parts and everything else. And you build on that throughout the time. But the tradition has been in our society to have the one off talk birds and bees or sex or whatever it is. And there's there's no real evidence that there is a particularly good time for that. You now through schools mostly get the basic biology around the ages of 12, 13, um, when they, they are about to transition from primary schools into high schools. Um, but there's different curricula and different approaches depending on how religious people are. So we've tried to get the Catholic schools to teach about porn and we've taught we've managed to teach catholic school teachers and priests and stuff but we've not had much success at all at getting uh, these sorts of more liberal programs into religious schools um, and well so my advice is that we need to spread things out so that it's more effective but what and, is interesting is that even before you sorry so. Sorry for being late into the meeting. Um, could I just ask, um, I'm not sure you may have covered it already, but about the role of computer games where there's porn, well, like something like Grand Theft Auto, where there's lots of sexualized action. Um, I do a, a peer support mental health group with dads. And just last night, one of the things they were talking about, and they're increasingly talking about, I notice the games that they play, but last night's conversation sort of really was going around about going to um you're going i think it's uh, i'm not i think they thought well they were talking about children and going into um, a room and getting drinks and anyway there's obviously a prostitute in the room and this was something that they were talking about as part of it is our computer games becoming increasingly pornographic and or is there the link between between the two? There's lots of, of, of yeses to your answer. There are links between the two industries. They, they, there's common technology platforms, common developers, and the way that um, the, the pornography affects your brain and the way that gaming affects your brain to develop addictive behaviours is exactly the same. So the underlying biology that you're coming to is the same. Grand Theft Auto is now, what, eight, nine, ten years old? It's, and you've been able to um, rape and kill a prostitute in it the whole time. And it's a very popular activity, I'm told. And you're thinking, no, that's not the way to run a society. Um, there is more and more sexualized material in games, but the games industry is very, very broad. So you could be playing computer games all of the time and have no sexualized content. Alternatively, you could be in a gaming world where you're having lots of sexualized content. The other thing is, um, we have a colleague who set up the world's biggest um, online recovery site, um, Alex Rhodes, the guy who set up NoFap in America. I don't know if you've come across that. NoFap's got like a million members now, and they try and get people to unhook um, and try and stop masturbating to porn. But Alex's own story as a 15-year-old as a 
is when his parents would be at work and he's on school holidays, he would do um, 14 hours mixing porn and gaming. He'd do half an hour of gaming and half an hour of porn and masturbation and then repeat that all day, which means he was masturbating 14 times a day. And the, the groups that he was used to multiplayer games, he'd be on and he'd say, you're stopping now to go off and masturbate or to, to do porn and come back half an hour later and back on playing some more game and then off. And it ruined his sexual health and ultimately his response was to set up um, an organisation that tries to not have other boys go down the same rabbit hole. Um, so the, the links are very strong and certainly if you're a 14, 15 year old boy or girl and you're interested in un, uh, so unsurprisingly gaming and sex, well it's got huge potential to combine. Is there particular types of people, personality traits, that um, have problems with the with addiction or porn? You know, is there you know is there things you can kind of look out for with particular individuals that make them more susceptible? Well, there's there's been quite a lot of work done on things like the Big Five um, personality traits and the Dark Triad or whatever. There. Are, uh, there is modest links between personality traits and uh, the likelihood of ending up with um, problems from consuming too much pornography. But the simple reality is that anybody who, who consumes too much and keeps consuming um, has the potential to end up with the, these sorts of problems. Um, and uh, there are a couple of groups that have particular vulnerabilities. People who have learning difficulties or on the autistic spectrum um, make up disproportionate numbers of the people who say who are being charged with possession of um, child abuse imagery. And they're an entirely new group that was never there before. People um, on the spectrum and with learning disorders make up under 2% of the general population. They also make up more than 30% of people who are charged with possession of child abuse imagery. Um, we've been working with various professionals to try and get that message out and we've done talks specifically on that quite recently. So there are personality elements that are important, um, but, um, but it's not one of the things everybody is vulnerable, provided you're doing the porn masturbation orgasm set and you get into it and you keep doing it and keep doing it. Pretty much any person with any personality type can have a problem. And if there was one thing that you could legislate for right now, or you could change within society, if there's one thing that you think is really important, what would it be? I think recommendation is age verification because it fundamentally changes um, the trajectory of our society. Um, we, we recognise that no, there's no legal or technical way of banning pornography. It cannot be done with current tech. Um, there's too many ways around with virtual private networks and whatever, and there's too much porn. You can get it through any, any possible medium. Eventually, artificial, tech, um, uh, sorry, artificial intelligence um, tech may make it possible to filter out all porn. Uh, you can currently do those sorts of things, but, but fundamentally the important thing is to start moving in the right direction. Um, the other thing that we've been um, joining the campaign for, there's been a, a, an online petition to try and um, ban Pornhub called traffickinghub.org and uh, because uh, it turns out that Pornhub uh, among its free videos include a large number of um, examples where children were being raped and the films were being streamed and, and monetized by Pornhub. Now that petition has received more than two million uh, signatures worldwide and as a result uh, Pornhub have uh, taken down three quarters of their videos because they hadn't bothered to verify anybody's age. Uh, they've still got two and a half million on so you're not going to miss out um, but they did take more than 10 million um, videos down and uh, MasterCard and VisaCard both withdrew their financial processing of payments to Pornhub as a result. So that would be an example um, of big picture stuff where people like ourselves in civil society are trying to encourage better behaviour of commercial porn companies. But all you had to have to upload any porn of anybody um, of any sort 
was uh, an email address and a user's name which you could generate yourself. Pornhub did not check anything. It's interesting though that for such a big, um, you know, for these big corporate organisations, you know, the credit card organisations and so on, and for, and for the Pornhub itself to take down three quarters or whatever it was, two thirds of its videos, it had to be that subject, you know, um, there's child um, abuse going on on your website. So it was the really extreme end, you know, but the other stuff that you're talking about um, it, it, in your presentation, all the impacts, it's just been diminished, isn't it? It seems to be, it's just, it's just not been given its kind of the profile, um, you know, um, by any of those uh, organizations through, I guess that's the way of the world. Um, you're absolutely right. And the, commercial pornography's industry um, approach is to use the manufacturer of doubt, exactly the same as Big Tobacco used and the oil companies did with climate change. Big porn um, seeds doubt. So they get lots of uh, articles placed in the press always saying that porn is good for you. And they mostly will um, accept that child abuse imagery is not acceptable. That still doesn't mean that they don't cheat. They simply don't check. Um, but it's, um, well, society really hasn't woken up yet. And we're part, of, and our charity is part of the process of trying to encourage. And, but even when you do wake up, I mean, we still have fixed odds betting terminals in the UK. Um, we still have um, hundreds of alcohol outlets all over um, Scotland. Um, the um, levels of, of drinking and um, of, of fighting and everything else during um, uh, lockdown and COVID have remained high. Um, so even though we know the, uh, the, the, the harms of other behaviours, that the alcohol, the drugs, the gambling, um, well, it damps it down by regulating and knowing it's there. Um, pornography has not yet got to anything like that point, but human beings like um, stimulating their brains, gambling, as gaming, a, drugs. Yeah, I mean, as, as I mentioned earlier, we have had uh, people from uh, Fast Forward who, who, who work around the Gamble Aware agenda coming on and doing a talk with us and so on. And again, you know, we all think we know what gambling is and the impact it has, but it's not until you listen to someone with that expertise talk about it. It's a real eye-opener. And again, and, and once, I don't know about anybody else in the team, but once I've kind of taken part in that, you, you never look at a gambling advert the same, you know? When you oh, watch yeah. football and you've got the big name footballers from back in the 80s or whenever it was, advertising party power, you just, you're just kind of shaking your head in disbelief. Um, and, I, and I'm guessing in the same way that Molly was talking about uh, gaming and or asking about gaming and the like, I, I mean, I imagine the answer is a pretty obvious one. If someone, it's, it's the endorphin rush, it's the buzz of gambling. Yeah. And the positive pornography must be pretty much neurologically kind of very, very aligned. And I can imagine an adult almost being addicted to both, really, sort of thing, you know? Uh, well, uh, quite early in the talk, I spoke about co-addictions, comorbidities. Yeah. And an awful lot of people don't just have one problem. They, they usually end up with two or three. So they will end up with a gambling problem and a porn problem, or a gambling problem and a drink problem. And the thing that keeps them going on the porn problem is the fact that apart from having an internet connection, it doesn't actually necessarily cost them very much. Only 1% of people consuming porn are spending money on it. That 1% is still enough directly to make the industry profitable. Most of the, the, the data and advertising is where the money comes from. Um, the fact that the companies have a profile of your, um, well, every, every time you log onto a porn site, that IP address is kept. About a third of all people who are anonymously browsing, um, the porn company knows exactly who you are, how old you are, what your name is, what your credit rating is, everything else, because they join stuff up at the back end. And that means that they can then sculpt the material they show you to be, get you more addicted, exactly the same as gambling companies have a range of things, a range of games to do uh, to keep you going there's always a, there's a, a way in 10 pound bonus and then off you go um Darryl, thank Thanks, you so much. um uh, thank you for so brilliant really fascinating uh talk i was just wondering um if you were say 
for example, if you were a family worker and you suspected that, um, you know, if you may perhaps you were dealing with a, a dad who um, had a gambling issue, for example, um, but you suspected that actually pornography might also be kind of in the mix as well, how would you go about kind of broaching the subject with them? Um, you know, or if you if you were with a family and you suspected that that might be a problem with the in you know a relationship, because obviously you don't want to jump to assumptions and you know. But I mean, how how would you go about kind of actually broaching the subject? With we have a, a suggestion. I'm um, oh, sorry, there's two parts. I'm just just taking note there. My colleagues give me. Um, so um, well, the question always needs to be put into words around something like how much time are you spending online and then you could say you know is how much of that is on gambling and this is, is how much time on porn or whatever would be one way of doing it and that what we know we have to do in the sh in the short to medium term is to train the professionals to have the skill set to do this so we've now trained a few hundred um, healthcare professionals uh, through the course that we have accredited by the Royal College of General Practitioners and essentially the day is about getting them to a point where they're confident to as a part of their GP consultation or if they're a school counselor or whatever that they're they're confident to be able to have the conversation to find the starting words that work for their um, audience and um, like the, it, it depends social workers need a, a somewhat different set to say health professionals or school nurses or whatever but they all need the confidence to know that um, they will ask the questions I mean as Screen, I've always thought screener. Um, the um, a doctor will um, look up your bottom but won't ask about your porn use that doesn't make any sense to me doctors have now all learned to ask about alcohol you cannot normally well the GPs I've been to you can't go in there without getting asked how many units of alcohol you're drinking per week the conversation about pornography and sexuality needs to be a part of the same conversation and to have the same just automatic natural um, relationship with the the client whether they're a, a, a health client or there's someone you're counseling or there's someone you're helping as a social worker or otherwise intervening in families that's the and the answer is we're a long way from it we've trained a few hundred people um, like there's 65,000 GPs in the UK most of them still no no idea do you find are you finding that um, issues around gender identity are muddying the waters or is it is there no problem around that? Well, there's a problem if you um, allow there to be a problem in terms of what we try and do. We try and steer away from the gender identity trans um, arguments. It hasn't. We haven't been a hundred percent successful about that, but we've. Um, it, 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 it's really quite difficult, um, and we have on occasions had some quite challenging conversations because. There's good evidence that um, pornography consumption can help change people's um, sexual tastes. And so you end up, um, if you watch enough porn, you can have straight people starting to think they're gay because they watch lots of gay porn because it's more shocking and then start to um, behave, or move into a, into a gay world. And there's a whole series of things that can happen there. Now, some people are really quite in, in, um, uncomfortable about having that discussed. And we have on occasions had um, people in some of our courses react quite um, uncomfortably to it. Um, not very many, but we try and we try and keep things at a very broad and vanilla issue. But essentially, the the majority of people who are having um, violence issues directed against them are women, and you can demonstrate that through porn. And most of the people having sexual dysfunctions are men. But we know several women and we have recordings on our YouTube site of uh, one woman who was a sex and porn addict and it utterly destroyed her life. Uh, she'd been um, abused as a child by her father, has that, her three sisters, and she grew up to become, you know, she, from the age of 15, she became a porn addict. She went to, to, did a high school job to buy a computer so she could watch porn. And by the time she was 29, she was some sort of a mess. Um, and um, was, you know, forget to go to work for three days because she was watching porn and um, partying with people on the internet and drinking and everything else. So at the most extreme, it can ruin anybody's life. And gender is an issue 
but we try and take um, a consensus position there. But it will always be a challenge, and it is becoming more challenging with time. Um, issues like gender reassignment, um, recent court um, issues there in terms of can you use puberty blockers and that sort of stuff. Um, not much research, has, good quality research has been done on um, that yet, but it is coming. Well, it's been really interesting having you on, Daryl. You've, you've, you've been on a lot longer than we asked you to come on for. <laughs> That's okay. Um, uh, I don't know if anyone has anything else they'd like to ask, Daryl, before we round off. No, I, I did just wanted to, just to just to, um, to say, um, Daryl, that um, I I run the WhatsApp group for Dads um, Fathers Network Scotland, and I just the amount of porn we get on there, just people joining the WhatsApp group and kind of posting porn or adverts to, to porn content and then leaving again. Um, yeah, it's just been quite an eye opener. From I guess I've as, as a woman put myself into this like men's world. And um, yeah, I've just been quite shocked at just how much that group has been targeted, even though, you know, it's a relatively small group, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, so just just an insight from 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 me about that. But uh, yeah, I've been quite surprised. Well, I'm sorry to hear it. And I think you're just going to have to put up with more and more. Yeah, um, I know. And I think it's uh, yeah, monitoring it. And, and actually, um, WhatsApp doesn't really allow much security for that either. You know, there, it's not like you can put blocks on it or anything like that. So um, and I know that lots of uh, organisations that we work with um, use WhatsApp, especially now, you know, when we, we're not able to meet face to face. Um, and uh, yeah, it's certainly something that um, that, yeah, I think it's a problem that a lot of organisations are going to face who, who use kind of services like that, because it's not really like uh, like a Facebook group or something like that where you can approve content and stuff and put kind of uh, questions in for people to join or whatnot. So, yeah. And uh, yeah, as you okay. said at the uh, start of your talk there, uh, Daryl, anybody watching this, if they have any questions or queries or looking for any advice, it's just a case of going on to, would it be you? No. No. no? Very good, I think. Sorry? I'm having some stability um, of the internet issues here at the moment. It's wobbling. Ah. Right, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now, Chris. Sorry. Okay. You keep freezing. Oh, sorry. Is it me then, maybe? No, um, it's at this end. Um, uh, I'm getting a message on my screen saying unstable internet, which is really annoying given we have 600 meg internet here. Um, yeah, it was just to say that you mentioned at the start of your talk that um, if anyone has any questions relating to your talk, they can they can contact you directly. And would that be through your website? Is that the best place? You can. Uh, we're happy to take things through our website. There's a contact form on every page if people want to do that. Equally, if they want to send anything through Fathers Network Scotland, um, we're quite happy to respond. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Great. Okay, well, um, I don't know if there's anything you'd like to round off with, Daryl, or do you think we've kind of... Uh, covered it all? Or? Well, I suppose I'd just like to say at the end that we think that it, it's possible for things to be positive and to get better. We think that, it, that fathers have a very important role in terms of getting the conversation happening and sustained within um, a family and within wider society. And, um, you know, good luck to you fellas and ladies on what you do, because um, it's awesome. And um, I'm, I'm proud that Scotland's got Fathers Network Scotland. Great. Yeah, well, thanks very much, Daryl. And I'm sure we'll keep in touch now that we know what you do. And, and, and uh, I've, I've heard you talking so on. It's been really interesting. And as Cathy said, you know, it poses so many questions. It's just, uh, it just adds another, another whole dimension to the conversation that we're having, you know, and it makes perfect sense. So, um, so watch this space, Daryl. I think you'll be hearing from us. Thank uh, you, Chris at some point over the next wee while and um, when we're doing a research in particular possibly if that does go ahead um, I imagine that we will be um, reaching out at some point. I'll be very happy to help you um, on any aspect of that sort of work because finding effective ways to link to government is always challenging and when you have got um, a good dialogue and the potential for research and for positive work 
we'd very much like to come along. Thank <music> you.